Sony a6700, the complete guide. This little hybrid camera is quite powerful for photos and videos, but like anything, you gotta get your settings dialed in. Maybe you're here because you have a new Sony a6700 and you wanna do a complete deep dive into the camera. Respect. Or maybe you're just thinking about picking one up. Well, you've stumbled across a great video that's gonna accomplish all of that. In this video, we're gonna cover how to get the most out of your cinematic video settings. We'll also talk about how to get the best results in low light situations, as well as how to maximize the photo capabilities out of the A6700. Might even take a look at what accessories are actually worth even picking up. But first, I guess it makes sense to start with whether or not this camera is even good in the first place. Has Sony finally made the perfect camera with the A6700? Outstanding video quality, extremely sharp photos, and a feature set that is truly incredible. All of that very well could make this the perfect camera. I'm gonna show you eight things about the A6700 that make it a very strong offering. But we're also gonna look at some potential downfalls that could hold it back from being that perfect camera. And through all of that, you'll get my honest review of this camera after some heavy use to help you decide if this is the right camera for you. The video quality coming out of the A6700 is truly impressive. You've been looking at it this whole time and this entire video will be using the A6700 besides maybe some B-roll actually of the camera that I'll be using like an A7C Mark II. This camera gives us all of the codecs, frame rates, bit rates, and color depths that are coming in all of the recent Sony cameras. We're getting 4K24, 4 4K30, 4K60, and 4K120. And the codecs, we have XAVCS, XAVCHS, XAVCSI, all of those in 422. 10 bit color. And if all of that is over your head, just use XAVCS. It's a great codec and you're going to like your results a lot. It's great that we get 4K 120 in this camera, something we've asked Sony for for a long time with the A6000 series cameras. It does have a 1.5 times crop. So besides that punch in you have to deal with, you're going to get a little bit of a quality loss there, but I think the image is still outstanding. And in 4K 60, we're using the entire sensor, so no crop at all. And it's a 6K sensor that's down sampling to 4K. The quality is really high in that 4K 60, I think is a huge strength of this camera. We get all of the classic Sony picture profiles as well as the highly desirable S Cinetone. And now that we have 422 10-bit color, we can actually utilize S Log 3 to its full potential. And just like 4K 120, another feature we've been asking for for a long time in these Sony cameras is the ability to preview and upload our own custom LUTs and look at those in camera before we even start shooting, which is something that we can do do in the A6700. And as far as crop sensor cameras go, this camera does perform extremely well in low light situations. In my experience, I've found that going up to 12,800 ISO is completely usable. Before going much higher than that, the image starts to fall apart a bit, but 12,800 is really impressive. You can also live stream simply by connecting a USB-C cable to the camera and your computer in 4K30, which makes it a good streaming option. We're about to look at how good the A6700 is at auto focus. At any point during that section, if you're getting something from this video, let me know by giving it a tap on the thumbs up. And while you're down there, hit that subscribe button if you want to see future videos about the A6700 or some photo video education, because that is what this channel is all about. In regards to autofocus, this camera simply doesn't miss. It's likely due to the fact that it has a bunch of different subject recognitions that we can do with complete tracking across 93% of the frame, which is a lot. In short, I have pure confidence with this camera when it comes to autofocus. A lot of that autofocus strength comes back to the new AI chip that's in this camera, which comes with a few additional features. One of the biggest features that comes from that AI chip besides that incredible autofocus is this auto framing which if you're a solo creator, it gives the effect and the look like somebody is filming you, which can be really valuable. And it's one of those things I didn't know I needed as a solo creator until I first had access to it in the ZV-E1. So it's nice to see that they brought this into the A6700. Compact cameras are usually a letdown when it comes to their build quality, the amount of customizable buttons, the size of the grip, and the amount of dials. But the A6700 is probably the best that I've seen. First off, it uses the Sony NPFZ battery. Kind of a mouthful there. Anyways, that battery is the same one that you see in the A7S III, the A7 IV. It's a bigger battery, but it has a very good battery life. It's one of the best out there. And because of that battery, we get this substantial grip on the A6700 
under, which is a huge win in my opinion. The grip is fantastic, especially if you look at it compared to my new Sony a7C Mark II, which is a full frame $2,200 camera, and the a6700's grip is just way better. We also get three dials for aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, which is new on these a6000 series cameras, where previously we were pretty limited on the amount of dials that we had. We get a fully articulating touch screen that we can actually change the settings on via touch, which is particularly convenient when you're doing a vlog style shot and you wanna change some settings. You're getting the updated Sony menu system, which they finally got right after a lot of years of going through some pretty rough menus. It has the digital hot shoe, which you can use the new Sony microphones and not have to worry about connecting any cables. And you get manual toggles from switching between photo, video, and S and Q, which is a really important feature for a hybrid style camera, meaning you're switching from photo to video often. And having that manual toggle is one of those small things that goes a really long way. I don't know what Sony did about six months ago in the ZV-E1 is where I first noticed how much better their color science was. And it seems as though, at least in my experience, that same color science has carried over to the A6700. That's a big win. So if you're considering upgrading from an older A6000 series or like a ZV-E10, you're not only gonna notice the 10-bit color versus you were using 8-bit in the past, that being a huge upgrade in your color. But you're gonna notice that you're gonna like the color rendition a lot better with this new color science. And if this A6700 happens to be your first camera, you're jumping in at a good time. One of the most common questions that I get in my one-on-one -on -one coaching calls is how to make your colors look good. I found that the foundation of making your colors look good comes back to having really good exposure, which is why I put together a two-part comprehensive free course all about exposure. Everything from shutter speed, aperture, ISO, to how to get the right exposure in camera. You can check that out, it's free. There's a link in the description. If a camera is claiming to be a hybrid camera, that means that it's good in both photo and video. We've already talked about how good the A6700 is in video. The good news is that for photos, it doesn't disappoint. You can shoot in up to 11 frames per second in compressed raw, and I found that I get about 60 shots before I fill up the buffer, which is pretty good. And whether you're in burst or you're just taking single shots, the autofocus on this camera is sticky, it's accurate, and I have pure confidence in it. And again, it covers 93% of the frame, which is a lot. You're getting 26 megapixels for your photos, which I think is a sweet spot for a camera like this. Reminds me a lot of the a7 III, which was fantastic. The images are sharp, the files aren't too big, the color rendition is outstanding, the autofocus is on point. Yeah, it's really good for photography. Yeah, you read that right, overheating. I have this as one of the points that make this camera a really strong offering to potentially being Sony's first perfect camera. I can't get it to overheat in 4K 24 frames a second, whether I'm in the studio or outside in about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. I've let it go and completely drain the battery for about two hours to see if I could get it to overheat and it won't. And if you're in extremely hot temperatures in direct sunlight, you might get it to overheat, but in my experience, I can't get it to. I also ran it for an hour in 4K60 until the SD card filled up. It never overheated and I just stopped the test. Looking at Gerald Undone's video on this camera, looks like he got about two hours in 4K60 and didn't get it to overheat either. I did, however, get it to overheat in 4K at 120 frames a second in about 20 minutes of continuous shooting, but I don't really see that as a downside because 99% of us were not using the camera in 4K 120 besides a few bursts here and there of 60 seconds or 30 seconds to get a quick shot. But speaking of downsides, this is where we identify if this is Sony's first perfect camera because we're gonna talk about a few things where it might come up short. First thing is rolling shutter. If you're filming incredibly fast moving subjects or you're whipping the camera around and you want your lines to be straight with this camera, they're gonna be warped and they're just not gonna be straight. That said, the majority of us are not gonna be noticing a thing about rolling shutter with this camera because we're not whipping it around or taking photos of Major League Baseball. The viewfinder. I personally just hate the location of the viewfinder in the A6000 series cameras but it uh, gets the job done and it's not a deal breaker. There's no joystick. And Sony, can we please get joysticks on every single camera? It is so important to be able to move your focus point around. I think it's the most natural way to do it. I mean, sure, there's workarounds with having a touch screen or some other ways to set your focus point, but there's nothing quite like that joystick. It's got a micro HDMI port and micro HDMIs are the worst, they break. Just like the viewfinder, they do the job, but they're just not ideal. But if you're not using an external monitor on your 
your camera, you're not gonna need to worry about this at all. It's got one SD card slot and knock on desk. This isn't wood, knock on desk. I've never had an SD card fail, but if it were to fail, best case scenario, you have two SD cards in your camera, you're recording redundantly. That way, if one of them fails, you're still safe by having the second one in there. This camera only has one. So if you're capturing once in a lifetime things like a wedding, for example, you're probably not gonna be using this camera as your main camera professionally. So is it Sony's first perfect camera for everyone? No. There's no such thing, but I think that what you get in the A6700 for $1,400 is unmatched. And it very well could be the perfect camera for you. So who's it for? Who is it the perfect camera for? This is saying a lot. I think it's the perfect camera for content creators. All the positives that we mentioned fit in perfectly for content creators and all the downsides are really non-issues. Unless again, you happen to be capturing once in a lifetime stuff, I probably wouldn't get this camera, it's absolutely not perfect. But for the rest of us content creators out there, it probably is perfect. So what do you think? Is it Sony's first perfect hybrid camera? I think it's pretty darn close. Next, we're gonna dive into all the cinematic video settings and functions out of the A6700. This is a big one, buckle up. So for the past few months, I've been shooting with the Sony A6700 right next to the A7 IV and the Z VE1, which are both cameras that should heavily outperform the A6700, but I've had a really hard time telling the footage apart. All of the cinematic functions in the A6700 that are working well for me, coming at you. So out of the box, you wanna switch the camera into manual mode as well as movie mode to be able to access all the settings that we're gonna be talking about in today's video. For our autofocus settings, the first thing I wanna talk about is how to use the screen to do touch tracking and be able to tap on any subject you want and track it. To do that, we're gonna go into the menu. I'm gonna to go to the bottom toolbox here, the yellow tab over here, number five, under touch operation, under touch, pan first off, make sure your touch operation is set to on. And then for your touch panel settings, we're gonna to go to shooting screen and then down here to touch function in shooting and make sure that is set to touch tracking. And then let's talk about the actual autofocus speeds, which is really important. So down here on the AFMF purple tab, we're gonna to go to AFMF. We have these two settings here, autofocus transition speed, I'll typically for a shot like this, an interview or like a studio shot, I'm gonna have this really low. And if you ever have a situation happen where you're noticing that there's a lot of pulsing on the edges of your frame, it's likely because you have a shot like this, the lens does matter here, but generally speaking, you have your autofocus cranked up way too high. I typically keep this a lot lower, if not all the way down here at the first setting. This now if it's a fast moving subject, I'll crank it up to something a lot faster to keep up with the action. I'll do the same thing for the autofocus subject shift sensitivity. Same idea, fast moving subject, I'm way up here. And then something a lot slower like this, I'm usually down on two or one for locked on. And trust me, it's plenty fast to keep up with a really simple shot that we're looking at right now. One thing you can do for this autofocus transition speed, let's say you want to use the back of the camera to tap and do like a rack focus. What I'll usually do for that is I'll usually have it a lot slower, like two or three, to have a natural kind of transition between two subjects. The A6700 has a really cool feature that allows us to really dial in our shutter speed. If we want natural motion blur, we want our shutter speed to be exactly twice the amount of our frame rate. So for example, if I'm shooting in 24 frames a second and I want good motion blur, I want my shutter speed to be at exactly one over 48. Previously with these cameras, we'd be stuck at using something like one over 50, which is close to a 48 shutter, but it's 50, so it's a little bit higher. In the camera here, if you go to the third tab on number five here under shutter slash silent, anti-flicker setting, if you turn that on, you'll have the ability, looking at my shutter down here, to get a lot more precise with your exact shutter speed. And in this case, for 24 frames a second, we can get that dialed in in exactly 48. As we're going through this, you might notice that you're coming across some menu items that you're gonna wanna find really quickly. Well, my menu, so at the very top here, this star, you can customize these my menu tabs and put whatever menu item that you want in there. How you do that under my menu setting, go to add item and you can find whatever item you wanna add into your shortcutted my menu system and build out your own custom tabs. I have a few videos planned for this A6700 on the channel that I'm really excited about, as well as a couple of in-depth guides on exposure as well as white balance. Not the most exciting topics, but ones that are gonna make your videos look really good if you can get it right. Anyways, if you wanna see those, make sure you subscribe down below. And while you're down there, if you're getting something from this video, let me know by giving it a tap on the thumbs up. Our codex, different frame rates and color options are probably one of the more important things with this camera and the A6700 gives us a ton of updated and high-end features. I'm on the third tab here. Number one, image quality and recording. 
File format, we have a few options. Let's talk about the 4K stuff. That's probably what we're shooting. If you have this camera, we have XAVC HS 4K, XAVC S 4K, and XAVC SI 4K. XAVC SI is technically your highest quality. They're also massive file sizes. XAVC S 4K is one of the most common Sony codecs, and the files are really nice and they're not too big. And then you have XAVC HS, which is my preferred codec. The only problem with this one is that it's an H.265 file, so you gotta to make sure that your computer can actually handle H.265 files before using it. Otherwise, you're gonna have some issues. But technically, it's a high quality file that's a really small file type, so it's kind of the best of all worlds there. I actually can't tell the difference between these three in terms of quality, more on that in just a second. And then in our movie settings, you can first have your frame rate options here. Now, if you're using something like XAVC-S, you're probably gonna have like 30p in here, and XAVC-HS, we don't have 30, so you might see different frame rates if you're not using XAVC-HS. For regular motion stuff, I'm shooting in 24p, and then for slow motion, you can use either 60 or 120. I'm typically using 60 more recently because I'm kind of getting tired of 120 but this camera can shoot 120 and the files are really nice coming out of it there. Next under record settings again these will look a little bit different depending upon which codec that you're using but here's our options in XAVC HS 24p and it's the same general rule of thumb regardless of what codec you're using. I'm going to be using the highest megs possible in this case that's 100 megs to get the best looking video and then always shooting in 422 with 10-bit color. Nice that they included 10-bit color in this A6700. It's one of my favorite things about this camera. The truth is though, between like 8-bit and 10-bit, we don't even have any 8-bit options with XABC HS. In other codecs, you will. 10-bit, you just have way more flexibility over your colors if you wanna be changing the colors. And I just think generally speaking, 10-bit looks a lot better. But I'm gonna let you be the judge if you can tell the difference between XAVC SI, XAVC S, and XAVC HS while I tell you about today's video sponsor, which is audio. Using audio for copyright free music and sound effects has unlocked my creativity and I've used it for all of my recent YouTube videos. Having a vast library is really valuable and audio crushes it with that, but it's not just stock music, it's music made by real artists and I always feel great about putting it in my videos. It's really helped me upgrade my edit with sync worthy premium sound. And their sound effects library, I think is one of the most underrated things on the entire platform. So if you need copyright free music or sound effects, you don't wanna have any stress about any copyright claims and you want really high quality stuff, you gotta join me on Team Audio. And check the special link down below using this code to save 70% off your first year. It's already an incredibly valuable platform without that 70% off. So make sure you take advantage of that. I'm not sure how long they're gonna make that thing last. Thank you, Audio, for sponsoring the video. I couldn't be happier to work with y'all. Another cool feature that the A6700 has is the ability to install our own custom LUTs and look at that footage in camera before we even get into post. Here's how to do it. First thing you wanna do is put your SD card in your computer and then put whatever LUT file that you wanna end up putting on the camera, put that LUT file in this exact place on the SD card. After that, once you put your SD card in the camera, here's how you find your LUT. I'm on this pink tab under number five, color and tone, manage user LUTs. You can import your LUTs here. So once you have the LUT stored on the SD card in the right spot, it's going to pop up here and you can assign it to whatever container that you want. After that, you can select the LUT right here. And I'm using Sony's conversion LUT, their official S-Log3 Direct 709 conversion LUT. I think that's the best one. And I'll put a link down below if you wanna check that LUT out. Now, if you're doing a workflow like I am where you're using your conversion LUTs because you wanna be shooting an S-Log3, here's how you actually display that information. Back over here in the third tab, we're gonna to go to number one and all the way down here in log shooting setting, you wanna turn log shooting on. This is what's going to give the ability, and you put S gamut three cine to S log three, if that's the same workflow that you're using like I am. And then when you go back over to this color and tone piece, in my case, this user one, this is the exact conversion LUT. You're gonna see that in camera, exactly what the log footage converted over to Sony's official conversion LUT is going to look like. You also have the ability here to embed the LUT file. I choose not to. When that's on, your actual LUT is gonna be embedded into your footage when you look at it in post. When it's off, like I have it, you're just seeing it on the back of the camera the way it's gonna look once you apply that actual LUT 
in post. So completely up to you. I tend to keep it off and just look at it in post. That way my file is always just a log file just in case something funky happens. Moving into our custom buttons and this is a huge efficiency hack for this camera because out of box I don't think the buttons are laid out all that well for video shooting. Here's how I have mine laid out. Down here on the toolbox we're going to go to operation customize and this is for photo, this is for video and in the video setting what you can do, you're just going to look different than mine right now. We'll go through each of these. How you map something is just go to the one you want a map. Let's say I want to map my AF on button here, for example. I'm going to click that and I can go through the menu and find whatever I want to attach to that button. My first button, the C1 button here on the side, I have that mapped to audio record level, something we use all the time in video shooting. Just a quick tap on that and I can change my audio levels really quickly. Number two, this is just the AF on button and I've mapped this over to white balance. And yes, on the camera, you technically can use the touch screen to access white balance balance as well as some other things. Maybe I'm old school, but I like having the manual buttons for these. It is nice though with this camera, let's say you're doing like a vlog style shot, camera screens flipped out, being able to tap and change things is nice. But generally speaking, I like to have these custom maps. So when I tap my AF on button, I can quickly just access different white balance settings. I'm typically using a Kelvin setting, so just manually changing my white balance. This is not a full tutorial on white balance. That video is coming in the future, like I mentioned. Critical to make your videos look good, but I'm typically just manually selecting my white balance setting via this Kelvin meter here or I'll be in auto white balance if I want to just have the camera do the work for me. And on my auto white balance, you might be noticing mine says auto white. There's a difference between how the camera handles, particularly like the warmer tones, if you're in regular auto white balance or auto white balance white. I prefer the tones in auto white balance white, even though it's like an incredibly, incredibly minuscule difference. Here's how to change that. Back in my menu system, I'm gonna go to this fourth tab and I'm gonna go to the white balance setting and then right here, priority set in auto white balance. Out of camera, it's gonna come in this auto white balance standard that we just looked at, or you can change it to auto white balance white. And then my trash can button down here, this is gonna be my auto white balance lock toggle. When you're in auto white balance and you let the camera get the scene, it takes about 10 to 15 seconds, let the camera get the tones of the scene and adjust its own auto white balance. And then what you can do when you tap this C3 button in this case, this trash can, you can lock the white balance so that way it won't change the tones as the scene might change a little bit. You can lock that off and not have any color shift and then it won't unlock or start getting auto white balance again until you toggle it off and then the camera will do its thing and calibrate the white balance. Moving into tab two, these two buttons here I have set to my zebra levels which is my preferred method to getting exposure, that being something of the utmost importance to get good looking videos. What I have when I hit left on my dial, it's gonna bring up my zebra levels and I can just cycle through those and then when I tap my center button I'm going to be toggling zebras on or off to be able to see those when they're popping up on those different levels. Video coming in the very near future about nailing your exposure. That's how I have mine set for quick access. And then my right button, I have that set to not set. That's because I'm gonna jump ahead here for a second. I have my wheel set to ISO. So as I spin this wheel, my ISO is gonna be increasing. And maybe it's just me, maybe I'm heavy handed, but whenever I'm twisting my ISO wheel, I tend to like press down on that right button. And the last thing I want is for some function that I don't want access to at that time to pop up. So I just leave that one not set. And then pressing down is gonna bring up my focus area and I can cycle between the different type of focus areas that I want. And when you do that, you might find you have more options here. These are the three that I use the most. I'll explain how to minimize your actual options in a second. Wide I typically use for touch tracking. Zone gives me the ability to just choose a section that I want to have the focus on and then expand spot. It's gonna focus on whatever's in that inner box as well as anything that's just outside of it for really dialed in focus. How to change, because I think there's like six or seven options when you cycle through your different focus areas. How to change that? I'm gonna go to this AF MF tab here under focus area, when you go over to focus area limit, whatever you have checked are the ones that are gonna show up when you try to cycle through your different focus areas. This center one to me, might as well just use zone or the expandable spot and put it in the middle. And then this uh, small, medium and large spots, kind of the same thing as expand spots. Trying to minimize the noise and the options that I have for fast turnaround. And the top of the camera, this third tab, uh, this first red button here I have set to picture profile. So I'm in log shooting right now, so I can't actually bring up my picture profile. This red record button we have up top, it's really nice. It's cool that they have that, but 
If you go into your menu and you go to the bottom here under operation customize and you go to record with shutter and set that to on, when you just tap your shutter button on top of the camera, the same one you use to take photos, it'll start and stop recording, which will free up an extra button, in this case, the red button to be used for a different customizable option, which like I just mentioned, I have that one set to picture profile. 90% of the time I'm shooting in log and using my installed LUTs to do that. But if I wanna shoot in something like S Cinetone, I turn my log shooting off, tap that for picture profile, pull up PP11 and now I'm in S Cinetone. The second one here, the C2 button, this is what I have set for focus standard. So let's say I wanna change that focus point right there. How I would have to change where that's actually positioned, I would have to go to hitting down on my, my wheel, pull up my focus area, go to zone, set it, hit down again, go to this expand spot, and now I can move it around, right? Kind of annoying a lot of steps there. Or because I've mapped that focus standard to C2, if I just tap C2, it lets me move that focus point around with just one click of a button. And this fourth tab, if you happen to have a lens that has a customizable button, I have mine set to focus mode so I can just toggle between autofocus or manual focus. And then lastly, for my wheels, this front dial, I have that set for aperture. My back one I have set to shutter speed and this back wheel here, like we've already talked about, that is set to ISO. I found that setting my most frequently used settings and functions to my customizable buttons is absolutely the way to go. But there's still ones that are really good and the ones that I still use often, but not quite as often as the ones I just mapped to my custom buttons. For those ones, I put in my function menu. So when I'm in this function menu, up top is for photos, we're talking about video today, you can customize all of these as well. How to change them, just select the slot you want, just like on our custom buttons, go through the menu and you can map whatever you want to that area. So pulling up the actual function menu here, we're gonna look at what I have set. First thing is focus mode. This is talking between autofocus and manual focus. Yes, that's redundant. Seems inefficient, right? Because I just talked about having that set to the customizable button on the lens, but I don't always have a lens that has a customizable button. So I wanna make sure that I have quick access to toggling from autofocus to manual focus. And these three are all of my codecs, frame rates, and bit rates that we talked about. So quick access to be able to change if I wanna be an XAVC HS, S, or SI, what frame rate I want, I can get that really quickly there. And then lastly, my actual record setting, I can quickly access that with that one. So these three used all the time. And then we have these two settings, which are gonna look familiar. This is how I can quickly access them, my autofocus transition speed, as well as my autofocus subject shift sensitivity. This next one here is my peaking display. So when I'm in manual focus, I can turn my peaking set to on, and then we're gonna get those dancing ants around whatever is in focus. Steady shot is next. This camera does have the ability to go into active stability. You're gonna get a 1.1 times crop on that. But you're gonna get a lot better stability for like handheld shots or like a vlog style shot. Standard or off is what I'll have if I'm like locked off on a tripod. And the nice thing about the A6700 is that it's a high megapixel sensor. So it's down sampling a 6K image to 4K. What's cool about that is when we go into, even if it's a 1.1 crop on active, if you crop in on a true 4K sensor, you might lose a little bit of quality because we're down sampling from 6K to 4K, you're not gonna notice much of a quality loss here whatsoever. And these last three are my auto framing. This camera comes with some of the new features of that auto framing, which is something that I didn't know I needed until I first had it in the ZV-E1, especially if you're like a solo shooter, having the ability to almost have a look like someone's filming you is pretty cool. So I can turn my auto framing simply just on or off via this function here. And then my crop level, you can go something wide, medium, or tight. I'll have their different uses. And then lastly, the framing tracking speed. I found that just like autofocus, just have this match whatever the action is. If it's fast action, make it fast. If it's slow action, make it slow for the most natural look. Memory recall. So with this camera, pick your most common style of shot and then put all of your settings together, right? Your frame rates, your shutter speed, your ISO, your white balance, put all of your settings that you want, literally everything, autofocus speeds, everything. Put that in, and then when you go here, you're gonna go to camera set memory, you can assign, you have three containers, so do this for each of your most common style of shots. And then when you tap this, it's gonna assign all of those settings to that container. You can then repeat that process for number two and three. Instead of putting the camera just in manual mode, you can put it in container one, two, or three, and that's what's gonna give you the ability to just quickly access those settings. If you wanna see how I have mine set up for number one, two, and three, a studio shot, a vlog shot, and slow motion are my most common three. If you wanna see every single detail of how I have that set up, there's a free link below. I've got a video walkthrough to show 
show you exactly that. There are a few like random annoying settings that we're gonna wanna take into consideration. The first one I'm down here under this toolbox and I wanna go down to finder slash monitor. So under this one here is select finder or monitor. Out of box is gonna come in auto. So anything that you put behind your viewfinder, it's gonna automatically just turn off the back of the screen or just switch it over to the viewfinder. So I have this set to monitor manual, which means that the monitor is what's always on. The back of the screen display is always on until I come in here, maybe switch it over to putting it on the viewfinder. This monitor brightness, sunny weather is gonna drain the battery a bit faster, but it's also gonna make the screen really bright Right compared to manual where it's not quite as bright. Still down here on the toolbox, I'm gonna go to number nine, and then over here, auto power off temp. So when you first turn on the camera, it might have you change this. If you happen to miss that and your camera is set to standard, it might overheat a little bit more frequently than you want it to. I have this set to high and I've had no overheating issues with the camera yet. And then this power save start time. Out of box, it comes in somewhere around like one or two minutes, I think. And essentially what that means, if you just turn the camera on, let it sit in this case for two minutes, uh, it's gonna just turn off. And you gotta go back in, like retoggle it on and off. It's kind of annoying. I have mine set to 30, just in case I wanna set the camera up, get the studio set up and then start shooting. I don't want it just to turn off in the meantime. I also don't want it set to off, where if I happen to leave my camera on and put it in my bag, it's gonna kill the battery. So 30 minutes is the median that works well for me. If you're wondering how to get the red frame around the screen when you're actually recording, if you go to this third tab, we're gonna to go to number 10, shooting display, emphasize record display, set that to on. Those cinematic video settings really unlock the full potential out of the Sony a6700. But what about when you're in those low light, those tricky low light situations, how do you make your images and your videos actually look good. Let's take a look at that. You can get excellent performance out of the Sony a6700. This shot, for example, is at 10,000 ISO, and the closest thing I have to a key light is a street light that's about 50 feet away. And look how clean this looks. I'm gonna show you what works well for me to get consistent results in low light situations. It comes down to three simple things. The first two are kind of obvious, but I do have a few tricks that you might not know about. They're gonna make a pretty big difference. And the third one was a huge aha moment for me. When you get them right, you'll You'll get footage that looks like this, even at those higher ISOs. When I first started shooting videos way back with the a7 III, I kept seeing people getting amazing low light videos and I was rarely making mine look good. I'd get lucky sometimes, but I was rarely able to have a repeatable outcome. So I got a little bit obsessed and I spent years identifying the main factors that led to finally getting repeatable and great looking videos out of Sony cameras in low light environments. And I'm gonna share those with you today so that you too can get great results with your Sony A6700. The first thing that will make or break your low light videos or photos for that matter is exposure. Regardless of what picture profile I'm in, I use the method I'm about to run through with you and the results have been really solid. Whether that's no picture profile or s cinetone or S-Log3, my go-to method for nailing my exposure for consistent results is using the zebra method. It's really simple and through a lot of trial and error, I've found that it gives me far better results than the other popular method which is overexposing to or exposing to 0, 0.0 or overexposing to plus 0 0.3 or plus 0 0.7 or plus 1.3 or whatever other overexposure values are being thrown out there right now. Here's how to do it. This is the Ansel Adams exposure chart. I'll include a free link down below if you want your own copy. Anyways, it represents the values that we want to expose things to. This is all gonna make sense. It's a bit complicated though, so let's simplify it and only look at the skin tones and the brightest highlights as those things are prevalent in the majority of the shots that we're getting. Next, identify the zebra settings on your A6700. I've custom mapped the ability to toggle zebras on or off to this button here. And then I've custom mapped the level that I'm setting the zebras to, to when they actually start to show up on the back of the camera to this button here. The nice thing is that those zebra values match the chart perfectly. Let's say that I have this skin tone in the shot. I'll simply set my zebra level or my zebra value in camera to that exact same number from the chart. And then I'll increase exposure. In this example, I'm just using ISO, but I'll increase exposure until the zebras just start to appear on the brightest part of that skin tone. And then I'll pull back 
by just one ISO click and that will be my exposure. And if I don't have a skin tone in the shot, I'm just gonna find a light, like a practical light that's in the frame. I know that light would represent the brightest highlight in the scene. So I'll set my zebra value to match the chart, which would be around 100, and then do the same method of bringing up the ISO until the zebras just barely start to appear on that highlight and then pull back by one click. And boom, we have exposure. Look, the zebra method is not a perfect way to get exposure. They all have their trade-offs, but this has been the most consistent for me. And if you haven't used the zebra method and you're also unhappy with the exposure of your low light shots, I'd encourage you to give it a try and I think you'll see really quickly why I use it so much. The second thing that's gonna upgrade your low light results is choosing the right ISO. In short, increasing the ISO on the camera is gonna introduce noise into the image. It's also gonna potentially do some color shifting and overall make it a lot softer. And these are the things that are gonna make your low light videos not look so good. But there are a few things that we can do in camera using higher ISOs that are gonna clean it up. The Sony a6700 performs really well in low light situations, especially for a crop sensor camera. And one of the main reasons for that is it has what's called dual baseline ISO. Let's break that down. Just for a moment, let's pretend that the a6700 only had one baseline ISO. What is a baseline ISO? Well, first off, off, every picture profile on the camera is gonna have a little bit of a different baseline ISO, but generally speaking, it's the lowest ISO that you can use for that picture profile, and that lowest ISO is also gonna give you the best performance, meaning a lot less noise than the higher ISOs. So for the a6700, and staying with this example of only having one baseline ISO, we'll talk about the second one in just one second. When I increase the ISO gain, the noise would simply increase for each increased ISO value. So if I wanted clean photos and videos, the lower the ISO, the better. But when we're in low light situations, we typically have to shoot in higher ISOs and that's where the problems come into play. Enter the benefits of the feature that's called second baseline ISO. A second baseline ISO allows us to get a low noise performance reset at a higher ISO value than the original first baseline. And the second baseline ISO happens to be exactly five clicks above the baseline ISO. Easy to remember, isn't it? Five clicks, let's break that down. If I'm in S Cinetone as an example, the first baseline ISO is 125. So one, two, three, four, and five clicks, and we're in our second baseline ISO, which is 400. And for S-Log3, the baseline ISO is 800. So again, one, two, three, four, five clicks on my ISO, and the second baseline ISO is 2,500. I'll include this free chart. I'll put a link down below if you want your own copy of every single picture profile baseline and second baseline ISO in the A6700. So I'm in S-Log3 here, where we learned that 800 and 2500 ISO will be our best performers in terms of having the cleanest videos and photos. This means that I'd rather shoot at 2500, even though it's technically higher than 2000, because ISO 2500 will have better low light performance. So because we get that ISO performance reset at that second baseline ISO, as we increase the ISO from there, we will start to introduce some noise, but can you imagine how noisy it would be without that second baseline ISO reset? What this essentially means is that we can shoot at higher ISOs and still get a really clean result. With that being said, I typically won't shoot over 12,800 ISO, in the A6700 because the image starts to fall apart a little bit and might not be quite usable. The final component that's working really well for me to get ideal results in low light situations with the A6700 is actually in the color panel of our editing software. Okay, I'm in Premiere Pro here, but the concepts that I'm gonna review are universal for whatever editing software that you're using. And the amounts that you'll make these tweaks are gonna depend on your shot but generally speaking, here's what you're gonna wanna do to reduce the noise in your low light shots. I'll bring the contrast up. The shadows are gonna need to come down and the blacks are also gonna need to come down a bit. And yes, this does mean that we might be breaking a rule here. That rule being over here on the Lumascopes, we're not gonna want too much of the data 
being pushed down to zero because we're essentially losing detail in the shadows. But what that's also doing, it's gonna clean up the blacks and the shadows of our shot and make them a lot less noisy. So in low light situations at higher ISOs, I almost always have to choose, do I wanna pull the blacks down and make it look nice and clean? Or do I wanna keep them high and not break that rule, but have a lot of noise in the shot? And if that's my choice, I will bring those blacks and shadows down every single time. So I want you to pay extra close attention to the shadows of this shot, because here is what we're left with after making those adjustments in our color panel. And because y'all are probably gonna ask anyways, my settings when I'm in low light, I shoot an XAVCS 4K, and I'm usually in S Log 3 with the S Gamut 3 Cine color profile because I think S Log 3 handles the higher ISOs the best. And my ISO level is a range from 2,500, and I won't go higher than 12,800. All of that should make your low light situations a lot more manageable out of the A6700. I'm gonna take y'all on a bit of an adventure for this next one. We're going back to my home area of the Pacific Northwest to take a look at how to get the best looking and most high quality photos using all the photo settings out of this camera. When you're in one of those once in a lifetime situations with your brand new Sony a6700, you wanna make sure that your photos come out sharp, that they're exposed well, that the colors and tones look good, and that you're able to navigate the camera in an extremely efficient way. And that's exactly what we're covering in today's video. I was recently back home in the Pacific Northwest in a lot of those once in a lifetime situations, and I can't wait to share with you how well the photos turned out and what's been working really well for me to get the best looking images using this new camera. Before we look at some of my favorite shots from the trip, let's make sure we're on the same page with some basic fundamental settings. First thing we wanna do with these foundational settings is make sure that the camera is in manual mode. This is what's really gonna unlock all the settings that we can actually adjust. Most commonly, things like ISO or our shutter speed or our aperture. Additionally, a lot of the things that we're gonna cover in some future tips, we're gonna wanna make sure that we're in manual to be able to access some of those settings. As an example, if you're in auto mode and you try and change some of the settings that we wanna be using a little bit later, they might be grayed out and that's because the camera is in auto. So to get full access, make sure you're in manual. On that note, if you're just starting out and you want to be in auto because you're not comfortable using manual settings yet, that's totally cool and you're still gonna get something from the points in this video. But at some point, I encourage you to jump off the deep end, dive into manual, even if it's just for practicing, just for practicing, jump into manual and start to get used to that because you're gonna be able to get a lot better images, but I recognize that it does take some practice. Next, let's talk about how to navigate the camera extremely efficiently, and that's gonna come back to our function menu and our custom buttons. Well, those once in a lifetime situations, you gotta hit your settings quick. I mean, even if you're just taking product shots or something that's not once in a lifetime, being able to navigate the camera efficiently is really important. Okay, starting with the function menu, I'm down here on the briefcase. I'm gonna go to dial customize. No, I'm gonna go to operation customize under function menu settings. And this top one here, this is for photo, down here is for video. We're talking about photo today. And anytime you wanna change one of these, yours is gonna look different than mine, but when you start changing it, it's gonna change how these look. I can just click on the cell that I want to change. I can tap that. I can go through the menu and find the thing that I want to map there. Here's how I have mine set. The first thing I have is going to be silent mode. So just being able to turn the camera from that shutter sound over to silent mode. Sometimes that's important if you need to be in a really quiet setting. Next is my autofocus tracking sensitivity. So how fast my autofocus is tracking. Next, my file format. This is when I can jump between RAW and JPEG. Interval shooting if I want to do time lapses. Soft skin effects, not something I use super often. Some people like it the way they look. So I will have that as an option if the person I'm shooting wants that. That. Drive mode, this is changing everything. I'm just gonna actually go into the actual function menu here. Drive mode, this is an important one that we will touch on in just a few tips. I can change whether I'm doing continuous shooting, so fast frames per second, or single shooting, or some kind of timed shoot. Next, my last thing that I actually have set is this recognition target. This is how you're gonna be toggling between what the AI autofocus system in this A6700 is picking up as the main subject of autofocus. We have human, animal slash, bird or you can target animal or bird for those bird photographers out there insects cars and trains as well as airplanes we also do have the ability on the touch screen on this camera to cycle those 
I don't love that. There's nice that we have touch functions on here. I do use some of them, but I do like the ability just to have the manual quick switch on that as opposed to toggling through on the touch screen. And then I actually just leave these ones completely not set. Those ones below that I can't even highlight right now. I'll show you what that looks like. Maybe over here makes more sense. I have these ones just not set. Uh, that's an option you can choose in the menu at the very bottom just to leave it completely blank. Uh, I don't use them. I don't want to just put things in there to have them in there. It's confusing. So I just leave those completely, completely blank there. Okay, next on the same tab here, I'm going to go to custom key slash dial settings on the uh, photo mode, not video, but for photo. And everything that we look at here, what gets highlighted is just in the same conjunction of what it is on the actual camera. So the first thing I have this custom one button, I actually have that not set for photos. I have all, all these things set for video, but for photography, if I don't need it, I don't want to access it frequently. I don't want to have that custom button set to anything. If I happen to tap it on accident. Button two, AF on. This is the button that actually says AF on. And this is the one that I'm gonna allow for back button focusing. I don't like half pressing the shutter for focus. I like holding this to tell the camera to start focusing before I take the shot. Number three is auto white balance lock toggle. I will save that point for a future tip coming up, a really important thing about white balance. This third button here, which happens to be custom button three, which is the trash can. And I have that set for auto white balance lock toggle. More on that shortly, but that's where I have that set. And then my center button of the wheel, I have that toggling whether I want my zebras to be on or off. So just tapping that will let me know if I have zebras. I use that for exposure, which we will spend time on in just a moment. And then tapping left on that wheel is how I choose my actual zebra levels. So I can quickly just decide if I want my zebras on or off, and then I can jump over and find what level I want them at with really quick navigation. So going into drive mode here on the right, yes, I have that as a function menu button as well. So a bit of redundancy there tends to be at least for me what happens if I sometimes forget that it's on the right. I know it's in my function menu, so kind of a fail safe. And this is one that I use pretty often. So I have some redundancy there. And then tapping down on the wheel is my focus area. So just choosing what type type of area I want to use for my focus. After that, let's go into one of the more important ones. I have this movie button up top set to not set. I don't want, I typically comes out of box and you can set it to anything else. But again, if I don't use something on there, I don't want to have too many buttons that do something. I have it to not set and I especially don't want it set to start movie recording because when I'm in photo mode and I hit that and the camera starts recording video, uh, not a good situation. So I leave that one alone. And then uh, focus standard for my C2 button. And that's an important one. That's what's going to allow me to tap that and move my focus point really quickly. That does come out of box. That focus standard typically out of box comes out set here as the center button, which does the same thing. But again, I use my zebras incredibly often and having those two buttons next to each other to turn zebras on and then find the level. I like having that set right there, but you can do with it what is going to make the most sense for you. This is what's working well for me. If I have a lens that has a custom button on it, I leave that set to focus focus hold. And then lastly, my dials, I leave these out of box. The only thing that I change these two here for my aperture and shutter speed, I leave those alone. But down here, I do change my wheel to ISO. Um, that way, all I have to do to change my ISO settings is spin the wheel. And that's a lot more like most cameras that we're used to a quick ISO adjustment, as opposed to what comes in the camera of tapping right and then cycling through your different ISOs. Tip number two is all about nailing exposure. Looking at some of these photos from the trip, it was really important that I got the exposure just right. Regardless if it was an epic landscape shot or more of a portrait, I used the zebra method to make sure that I had my exposure dialed in. I'm gonna show you in the A6700 exactly how to do that. I do have these custom mapped on my custom dials, which we did talk about earlier, but here's where they live in the menu if you're curious. I'm on the uh, purple tab here for exposure. I'm down here on number seven for zebra display. Clicking here here is how you can select if you want your zebras to be on or off. And then you can click here and you can choose your different zebra levels. I'll be using my custom buttons and showing you this for the remainder of this section of the video. But tapping my center button is how I turn zebra displays on or off. And then tapping left, I can choose the different levels. Uh, I usually use down here in my custom ranges. I actually like using lower limit over the standard range. And there's some complexity there that I will save for a future video, but I like using lower limit and then just changing the zebra values here of where the zebras are gonna start to appear on the image. 
But therein begs the question of like, well, what do you even set your zebra levels to? And this chart right here, which I'll provide another link down below if you wanna access that chart for free for your own copy, is gonna tell us exactly what to set the zebra levels to. This chart represents the values to expose things to on the IRE scale. So on the far right, we have 100. The benefit of that is when you're changing your zebra levels, all of the values that you're setting, whether it be 100 or you're sliding down to 90, just like on the chart, or 80, just like on the chart, you're essentially telling the camera, I want to see zebras on the parts of the image that are at, in this case, at 80 or anything above. Again, it syncs up with the chart perfectly. So if you memorize this chart or download it and have access to it on a regular basis, you'll start to realize that maybe you want to expose your brightest highlights to close to 100 or maybe a skin tone to 70. This is how you do that, is using that chart in conjunction with zebras. So when I have zebras turned on and set the values that I want, all I have to do is adjust the exposure to the shot using either ISO, aperture, or shutter speed until the zebras just barely start to appear on the part of the image that I'll be focusing my exposure on. Let's call that area the subject of exposure. The zebras might also be visible in other parts of the image if it has things that are at that same value or higher than your subject of exposure. But just ignore those and make sure that your zebras are just barely starting to show up on the part of your subject of exposure as you raise your exposure and once they just barely start to show up, boom, that will be your exposure. And since you're all gonna ask in the comments anyway about what lenses I use with the A6700 to get the shots that you're seeing in today's video, I'm gonna show you what they are while I tell you about today's video sponsor, which is Audio. Audio is an outstanding service to get completely copyright free music and sound effects. And they are my go-to resource for all of my YouTube videos. One of my favorite things about Audio is that it isn't stock music. It's music from real artists and I always feel really good about using them in my videos. And that sound effects library is so, so underrated. This has been such an important aspect of unleashing my creative potential and they make music licensing so easy and you don't have to worry about any copyright claims on your creative projects. They are really taking care of all the viewers of this channel by hooking y'all up with 70% off your first year. Making that first year ridiculously affordable and you can find all the details to how to get that hook up with the link down below. Thank you for sponsoring this video audio. Y'all keep doing what you're doing. I am a huge fan. And I may or may not have tried to do this sponsorship spot while doing a cold plunge in an alpine lake, but it uh, didn't go well. Legitimately frigid. We also have to deal with all these flies. These flies are coming in hot, making it real challenging. All the information, again, these flies. So join me. There's too many flies. Anyways, join me on Team Audio. I think you're gonna see what I see and how great they are for all of your creative projects. Tip number three, white balance. I found that to get consistent tones in my photos, I need to get my white balance right in camera. Sure, I'm shooting in raw, and when I get these photos into post, I can manipulate the white balance pretty heavily, but like I said, I've always found the most consistent results when you get it right in camera. When I took some of these shots, I was really focused on getting the white balance right. The A6700 has a few really interesting tricks that you can do in the camera to do just that. So when it comes to a couple of the auto white balance features that the A6700 has, there's, there's two things I wanna talk about. I'm on the uh, the purple tab here, the exposure tab down here on tab five for white balance. And the second tab here, priority set and auto white balance, you actually have some options of how you want the camera to handle certain tones, mostly the whites and ambient tones of the scene. It's gonna come out of box and auto white balance standard. You can also use auto white balance ambient or what I choose, which is the auto white balance white. So when you have your camera in auto white balance, it's gonna be essentially using whatever you have set here to manipulate the tones. It's not much and it's only in certain scenes, but what I've found is that I prefer what the auto white balance white does to the tones as opposed to something like the auto white balance standard. It's a very, very small thing. Play with that, see what you like. At least for me in the tones of images that I get and that I like the most, this tends to be the best fit. And the next one is all about locking the auto white balance. So instead of having to try to decide like what white balance to use, whether you wanna go down here and adjust the actual Kelvin or try to figure out if you're in like a cloudy day or some shade or some daylight, 
what you can do is just keep the camera in auto. Again, I have mine set to the white, so your auto might look a little bit different, but leave it set in auto. And then you can see that the camera's in auto by that display there by saying it's in AWB. And then if you want your tones to be really consistent amongst your images, assuming that they're in the exact same scene, this is important, but give the camera a second to get the tones and the white balance of the scene. And then I said earlier that I have my C3 button, the trash can, I'm gonna tap that now and you'll see in the bottom right hand of the screen, AWBL comes up. That essentially means that I gave the camera a second to get the tones and then I locked it. So it's not gonna change the tones at all. So all the shots that I do while this is locked, it's gonna stay in what it calibrated the white balance to be. Where that's really important is if I, again, I want my tones to be consistent in the exact same scene with the exact same lighting, let the camera get the scene, lock it, and all those shots are gonna have the exact same white balance. When I go to a new scene, I'm just gonna tap my C3 button again. I'm gonna unlock it. I do it all over again. Let the camera get the tones and calibrate the white balance and then lock it off again and repeat. If you're as impressed as I am with the photos coming out of this A6700, give this video a tap on the thumbs up. And while you're down there, if you wanna see all of the future videos and tutorials that I have planned for this camera, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss those. Tip number four and five, we're blending these two together because they just complement each other so well, is autofocus and whether or not to shoot in RAW or JPEG. I was able to get the camera out for some wildlife style shots on this really cool whale watching tour. I was really happy with how these shots turned out, but to get these shots to look good and sharp, I had to make sure that the camera had the right autofocus settings. I also had to have the correct RAW settings to get the fastest burst or fastest frames per second to capture some of the action. These autofocus and RAW settings tips are really simple, but they can make a huge impact. Let's take a look at exactly what I did to get these photos. Okay, autofocus settings is really simple. I have that in my function menu and I can change my autofocus tracking speeds here. You can either have it as locked on or really responsive. I usually leave it at four, so somewhere close to responsive. This isn't gonna make a huge difference when it comes to photography, but almost always I want the autofocus tracking to be quick if I'm trying to actually track a subject. For video, it's a little bit different. We'll probably come way down here, but for photography, somewhere around here is usually what I want because we're typically wanting to track some kind of fast moving subject. And even if it's not a fast moving subject, we want our autofocus tracking to be able to keep up with whatever we're doing. As an example, when I'm shooting wildlife and the whales are moving pretty quickly, I wanna keep my, I'm trying to track them. I wanna keep, make sure that the camera's autofocus and it's ridiculously good and this camera is keeping up and it actually performed extremely well. Next is gonna be the raw over JPEG. So I'm over here, I'm gonna go up to the camera and we're gonna go to image quality, file format and we can choose either JPEG or RAW. We can do both if you want to do that, but RAW is going to give us the ability to manipulate the images the absolute most that we possibly can. Uh, JPEG is for like quick turnaround stuff. I am 99.9% .9 of the time shooting in RAW and then the RAW file type to get the fastest frames per second. So the fastest burst rate, we wanna be in this compressed version. I haven't seen a huge difference between these two. Lossless is not gonna give us the ability to have a fast burst. It's still pretty quick, but the file sizes are a bit bigger and it is, uh, it's just a bigger file, so it can't feed the buffer nearly as quickly. So I keep this in compressed 100% of the time, but especially on this next point that I'm about to make here when we go to our drive mode, when we want the highest frames per second in RAW, which is this high plus, Plus, we're gonna get the fastest frames per second on our shutter when we have this in compressed RAW. So on my wildlife example earlier, fast moving subjects, I wanted to be able to capture as, I filled up an SD card so fast, uh, but we wanted to capture as many images as possible to try to get that, that perfect shot. Then this is how I did that by using continuous shooting high, using the 11 frames per second that the A6700 does. And I made sure that the camera was not in lossless, that it was in compressed RAW. If you're in JPEG, you'll still get that really fast frames per second, but uh, we don't wanna shoot JPEG, we wanna be shooting in RAW. Photo settings, check. Video settings, check. Low light situations, check. A review on if the camera's even good in the first place, check. I guess all that's left is to take a look at what accessories are actually worth picking up for your Sony a6700. So you just got your brand new Sony a6700 and you're like, I need some cool shit for it. There's one accessory that I've come across that actually makes the a6700 incredible. It's not a new microphone, although this new Sony ECM1 is really good. It's not even a new travel tripod, although this one's really good too. It's something far more simple 
You see, camera cages can be really good for a lot of reasons. This is, this is all gonna make sense. Besides a cage providing all the benefits, like the obvious of being able to completely rig your camera out, for the record, small rig makes a really, really good one. So besides all that, they can also make the camera a little bit more robust and get rid of this little, this little pinky, floating pinky issue here. The A6700's grip is incredible, but uh, but yeah. And the nice thing about the A6700 is that it's really compact. So putting a cage on it just to get rid of our little uh, little problem here doesn't really make all that much sense. And Small Rig also solved that by making this half cage, which is a little bit more compact and still solves our little issue here, but can still be maybe a little bit bulky for this compact camera. But then we have this $29 little accessory that makes the A6700 incredible. I know, it's the little things that make all the difference. Let me put this into perspective. This is my $160 grip extension thing for the Sony A7C Mark II. And I think it's awful. See, it does the job of making the grip a bit bigger and being able to put the entire camera grip in one hand. But then if you want to actually mount your camera with this $160 grip extension, you have to put your, your plate on the bottom of it and then it makes the camera impossible to stand up straight and just makes it kind of weird. But then with this small rig base plate, we can actually fit our entire hand on the camera and it actually doubles as an Arca Swiss style plate so you can attach it to your tripod or whatever else you want to connect it to, like a gimbal. But then one more little benefit here is that it lays flat. Everything we covered today, including this fantastic little base plate that even has a little slot here to be able to take your battery out nice and sleek. Everything we covered today, I put all the links down below if you wanna find them. All right, that's all I have to give you for this camera. If you made it to the end, you're a beast, and hopefully I've made you 10 times more confident with your Sony A6700. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. See you.